Oké, okay, heeft iedereen zijn tribe weer teruggevonden? Ga je weer op die plek zitten? Uh, the second to last speaker of today I will introduce in English. Uh, her name is Rachel Lowenstein and she's joining us from Mindshare all the way from America. She's had a crazy busy schedule today. And I'm wondering who here has seen Black Mirror on Netflix? All right, which one of you liked it? All right. Then you're in for a treat because Rachel is here to talk to you about media dystopia and she's going to do that in a true Black Mirror-like fashion. She's going to show us what our world of future marketing could look like and maybe bring it a little bit closer to home than you might want. So please give a big round of applause for Rachel Lowenstein. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sure we can all collectively agree that the smartphone orchestra was incredible, um, and that's a tough act to follow, but I'm going to take you guys into media dystopia today. Now, media dystopia is a presentation that my team created where we look at what the future of media could potentially look, at, look like. We unveil this presentation every single year at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas to about 200 of our most senior level clients. And we consistently hear from clients that they oftentimes feel uncomfortable and provoked after seeing this presentation because our methodology for media dystopia and looking at what the future could look like is deeply, deeply inspired by the television show uh, Black Mirror, like Angela just mentioned. Now, because we were so inspired by the television show Black Mirror, where they take things in technology and culture and play them out to the most extreme, oftentimes terrifying conclusion, we do the same thing in media dystopia, but through the lens of media and marketing. A few caveats before we jump into dystopian land. Uh, first, we make provocations, not predictions. So I'm not a futurist. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, we're simply making provocations about what could potentially happen. Next, because we're making conclusions that are incredibly extreme and sometimes hyperbolic, there's no singular view in media dystopia. Oftentimes, the episodes actually play out in contradiction to one another because they are so extreme. And then finally, uh, most importantly, we don't talk about artificial intelligence at all in this presentation because at this point, AI is just like electricity. It's powering everything and humming along in the background. So it feels redundant to talk about it in a presentation about the future. Now, just like the Netflix show, Black Mirror, we break out media dystopia into episodic series. So this is season one. I'm actually going to be taking you through some episodes from season two today. But to give you a flavor of what we looked like in season one, uh, first, we looked in episode one at the future of voice and how voice commerce could kill brands in the future. The second episode was looking at what happens when the entire world becomes searchable through visual search. Episode three looks at what happens when media partnerships become completely obsolete. The fourth episode is about emotion-based targeting. Episode five is looking at the media multiverse. And the sixth episode, which is the only episode in all of media dystopia that I don't like presenting, is the Netflixization of the sports fandom because I don't really like sports which I'm sure is shocking, the girl in the leopard pants who doesn't really love sports. <laughs> um, the common thread in season one that we looked at were things that were externally disrupting our industry. So like any good science fiction trope, it's an asteroid coming to destroy Earth. As we were making season two, we realized that we were being a lot more introspective. We were looking at the things that were internally going to bring the industry to its knees. So with that, media dystopia gets dark sometimes. I mentioned that our clients feel uncomfortable after they see it. Season two is probably taking that even one step further. Um, and you guys are in for a treat because we're presenting my two personal favorite episodes from media dystopia, um, one of which is probably the darkest one we have in our entire roster. So we're going to go through episodes one and two today, but to give you a flavor of some of the other episodes, we also have an episode about blockchain, the rise and potential fall of virtual reality, and then looking at whether or not brands have a choice and whether or not they want to play in the world of politics and cultural issues. So with that, we're going to dive right into episode one, which is called Bundle Up or Die. And just like the Netflix show Black Mirror, we start every single episode with a snapshot from the future, which serves as an episode synopsis, and we'll go throughout the entire episode and back out how we got into that potential future. So for episode one, Bundle Up or Die, the snapshot for this future is that Kellogg's cereals 
and Kimberly Clark's baby care products are the inaugural partner brands in the expanded Disney Plus subscription service. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you here have ever in your life clicked on clickbait? Okay, so most of us in the room are telling the truth and some of us are just not willing to admit it because it's a trick question. In some regard, in some way, we've all clicked on clickbait. And a few weeks ago, I saw this headline right here promising to show me what Bernadette from a popular American TV show called The Big Bang Theory looks like in real life. I've literally never watched this show in my entire life, but I saw this headline and I was intrigued because she looks pretty normal, so how different could she look? So I clicked and I got to this page. And I didn't see Bernadette, but I did see that little next button right there. So I thought, what the hell, I'll click. And I clicked 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 and I clicked. And about 12 clicks in, I had wasted about 15 minutes of my time, and I still didn't know what Bernadette from the Big Bang Theory looked like, um, and I probably got distracted by some more clickbait. So all of this to demonstrate how messed up the world of content has become. Because since the beginning of mass media, there's always been this delicate balance between the amount of money that consumers were willing to pay for content and the amount of money it costs to create that content. And it would rise or fall, and it was a nominal fee that consumers were willing to pay because living at the center of it was brands. And brands would subsidize this cost for consumers and keep that cost low for consumers with this unspoken trust that they would get amazing content at a low but reoccurring fee. And then this trust was broken, and it was broken by clickbait and fake news and algorithms and a disappearing middle class and YouTube influencers and basically anything that said that good content should be completely free and nobody should have to pay for it. And we as an industry got really greedy. We were happy to lap up these really cheap impressions around completely garbage, sensationalist content like this in the hopes that somebody would potentially see our brand or our ads. In fact, while I was trying to see what Bernadette from the Big Bang Theory looked like in real life, I saw 87 different ads from 52 different brands all around completely garbage stuff like this. So while all this was happening, there was a new paradigm being created. And the new paradigm is that good content is not for everybody. Good content is for people who can pay for it. And increasingly, consumers are being trained to know that if they want the good stuff, they have to pay for it. So in turn, the subscription universe is exploding right now. So things like Netflix and Videoland here in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands, and Prime Now and HBO, all these video subscription services catering to really broad interests are just the beginning. More and more, we're seeing increasingly niche, verticalized interests being catered to. For example, if you love, let's say, scary movies, horror movies, you can spend $5.99 a month and get all you can watch horror movies on Shutter without ever having to see ads. Things like fitness are playing in this as well, so Peloton is a very expensive stationary bike, but where they get you in the cost is that you have to pay a $24.99 subscription fee every single month to get access to their fitness influencer classes, and they've just filed for their IPO and they're valued at $8 billion. Uh, obviously, things like music have played in this for a while with Apple Music and Spotify. But even places like sports, we always thought that there would be some sort of ad subsidy in sports, which is no longer the case. And that doesn't even include the micro subscriptions. Things like Patreon and Kickstarter, you can pay a little bit of money every single month to your favorite influencer and see all you can watch content from them, again, with no sort of ads. And moving outside of the world of content, this is moving into the world of products and services. So for example, Apple has their iPhone upgrade program. One of our clients at Mindshare Volvo has their XC40 subscription. You don't have to pay any upfront fee and you can subscribe to their latest vehicle. Uh, Lyft has their new Netflix style subscription service. And even Katz's Deli, which is the most famous delicatessen in New York City, has a subscription service in which you can pay a little bit of money every month and get smoked meats delivered to your doorstep, which is incredible. And it's not just consumers that like this. Wall Street likes this as well. So when Microsoft, for example, transformed their business from being a single investment into their software, instead into a yearly reoccurring revenue model, their stock prices jumped by over 300%. 
And all of this begs the question of how many subscriptions is too many, right? You can probably have more than 10, but something like 50 feels like a lot of subscriptions, which is why we're seeing the rise of things like Wells Fargo Control Tower and Trim, which are essentially services that allow consumers to unsubscribe from services that no longer suit them. And I just love this tweet up here from this guy named Alex. He says, just got mom Netflix and she's mad that HBO isn't on it, which is giving rise to this new buy one, get one model. This new model where subscription services are starting to bundle together. For example, uh, Hulu and Spotify, if you have one of these subscriptions, you now get the other one for free. Uh, T-Mobile and Verizon, two cell phone carriers, are now offering Netflix for free as part of your subscription to your phone. And then even in the world of digital content, if you subscribe to any one of these publishers, you get access to all of them. So what are the factors at play in this future? We have the destruction of the consumer content trust paired with the continued expansion of the direct-to-consumer economy with the consumer need to somehow just consolidate our subscriptions is leading us to a future in which bundled subscription services give rise to the unreachable consumer and intensify the fight for incidental loyalty. Now getting a little meta here just for a moment, incidental loyalty is a term that we coined in season one, episode one of Media Dystopia. The term basically means that in the future, consumers will not be loyal to brands because they like those brands or have a particular affinity for their services or products, but because things like algorithms and voice technology are just making them loyal by happenstance. More on that in a moment. On the unreachable consumer, this now means the thing that used to keep consumers from content, the paywall, is now the thing that is keeping them from ads, which means now there's this giant paywall, and in that paywall there's a bunch of different bricks with a bunch of different subscription services, which means that we as the ad industry are now living north of the wall as the wildlings, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, who want to just get south of the wall to save ourselves from any kind of destruction. Or if you're a pessimist, we are the white walkers who want to get south of the wall to destroy the consumer content trust once again. And who's living south of the wall but that guy? That guy is sitting safe and snuggly and warm behind all of his favorite subscription services without ever having to see the burden of advertising again because he's paying a premium not to. However, in the future, there will always be some sort of way that we can reach consumers with advertising. And we're calling that BB6, which is banners, billboards, and six second ads. So ask yourself, in the future, if you had to build your brand using only BB6, could you do it? Probably not. So this is a future in which the things that our consumers are most interested in are also the things that are least accessible to brands. For example, all of that comms work and audience insights that you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every, doing every couple of years goes completely out the window because for brands, it's not super helpful for you to know, let's say if you're a pet food brand and you want to reach dog enthusiasts, but if I'm a dog enthusiast, but I get all of my dog content from three Patreon creators, a newsletter, and a video subscription service from the Dodo, all of which have no advertising in them, advertising goes completely out the window and all that work means complete shit in this future. Um, next, there'll be bifurcated media plans between the content rich and the content poor. The content rich are the people who have the disposable income to live behind a paywall. The content poor are those poor bastards who are living in the world of clickbait and cat videos on the internet. Um, next, content will become king again, but this time without its queen of distribution. So this begs the question of how many brands in the future are creating content that is so good that consumers are actually willing to pay for it. Probably not very many. Then finally, there will be a constant jostling between uh, to control the payments or displace subrunters. And an anecdote to explain what I mean by that, uh, Netflix was paying 30% of all of its net new revenue back to Apple for anybody that came in through the iOS platform until about a year ago. So in this future, as more and more consumers are paying a fee to go behind a paywall, there'll be this question of who owns that payment, who owns that data, is it the tech companies, is it the content creators, or is it potentially brands? So if all of that is not scary enough in this future, that guy sitting safe and warm behind his paywall of all of his favorite subscription services is now also getting his soap, his toothpaste, two meals a month at his very favorite restaurant and his car insurance as part of his Netflix subscription. Because Netflix has decided to bundle with all of these brands and this guy right here does not give a damn what kind of soap he's buying if Netflix is giving it to him for that $8.99 that he's already paying. Which is exactly how in the future, 
Disney will partner with Huggies, Diapers, and Kellogg's as part of their Disney Plus subscription service, which is coming out very soon. It's not that far off to think that this would happen. First, uh, both of these brands are actually licensees of the Disney franchise, so they will probably partner with Disney in some regard around their subscription service. And in this future, they're now giving new parents free diapers and their cereal as part of the new Disney Plus offering. And if you're skeptical about this and think that that could never happen, it already is. There is a service in which you pay less than $100 a year, you get free streaming on dozens of flights around the world. You get discounts at hundreds of different grocery stores, free two-day shipping on all your orders, access to hundreds of thousands of television shows, movies, music, etc. Amazon is already doing this with Prime. And there are rumors that Apple will start doing this as well with their Apple Plus subscription service. People who have an iPhone, for example, will probably get this for free. And there are rumblings that Apple is going to potentially partner with entertainment companies and other brands to give exclusive access or exclusive content on this platform. So how can brands prepare for this future? Uh, first, think about where your audience falls and determine their reachability. We actually did a segmentation study at Mindshare looking at consumers who are behind the paywall for each and every one of our specific brands. Um, next, begin building your beyond the wall strategy for consumers who do live beyond the paywall. And then the last two go hand in hand. First, explore other brands or com companies that you can incorporate into your bundle, or if you don't have a bundle or want to expand into other companies, find ways that you can enhance another brand's uh, bundle in this future. So this is the second episode and the last episode that I'm going to be going through, and it's called Sound as the Savior. I alluded to the fact that media dystopia gets dark. It's probably our darkest episode, so stick with me if you feel a little bit depressed. I'm very sorry, but we will find some optimism. Uh, so the snapshot for this future is that in 2025, Beats a suite of headphones becomes the number one profit driver in Apple's portfolio of hardware. Now, before we talk about sound, we have to talk about pretty much every other piece of technology that's out there right now. And despite the buzz about driverless cars, smart homes, VR headsets, AI that may or may not come kill us all, there is a dirty secret that in many cases we are heading towards a regression. And I obviously don't mean something like that. We are never going to head back to the wonder years where we stop using our phones for everything from ordering food to finding our next great love interest. Because we love technology, right? It simplifies, it organizes, and it connects us. And you'd be hard pressed to find even a digital minimalist in this room who doesn't like getting what they want, when they want, at the push of a button. But there's a paradox to technology. And the paradox is for all that it's doing to make our lives better, it's also making us miserable. It's a unanimous agreement right now in the scientific community that we've never been more depressed, we've never been more anxious, and we've never been more distracted as humans than we are today. And scientists pretty much unanimously agree that this is in large part due to the amount of time that you spend on your phone and pretty much every other screen and piece of technology out there because we're addicted. And if I told you that I have this friend who has this substance in his pocket that he consumes over 180 times a day, and he goes away from it for more than 10 minutes or perhaps leaves it at home, he gets incredibly distracted and can't possibly go on with his day, you would definitely tell me that that person has an addiction. And that's exactly what's happening with us today and our smartphones and pretty much every piece of technology. But there's a reason why we're increasingly spending more time doing this and less time doing things like this, which are actually really healthy for us. It's because for the last two decades, our tech overlords have literally been training us to not only want to, but actually need to spend time with technology. And they do this on the simple premise that you get a thrill when you're rewarded. And that reward is a drug in our brain called dopamine. And dopamine is the same drug that gets released every time you take a sip of alcohol, every time you pull the lever of a slot machine at a casino, or every time you get a notification on your phone, a like on Instagram, a retweet on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are absolutely addicted to technology. A Chinese study, for example, has recently found that people who spend a lot of time on the internet have very similar brain scans and chemical makeups to people who are drug addicts. A clinic in India is treating its first patient for what they're calling it Netflix addiction. And finally, internet addiction disorder was just found to be an official mental disorder less than six years ago. So, like any addict, I think 
we are maybe reaching this point where maybe, just maybe, we realize how problematic this is, and we're trying to, or already are, powering off. So while consumers are riding this wave of doing things like digital detoxes and spending less time with technology, tech companies are now riding this as well and trying to supply this demand. Apple and Google, for example, at both of their developer conferences last year, created software that basically tells you how much time you spend on your phone every single day. But what's scary is that these same tech companies are just finding clever ways to keep you addicted. So Verizon, the second largest cell phone carrier in the world, last year introduced an option to their plans called Palm. And Palm is essentially a stripped down version of a smartphone. You can text someone, you can call someone. And to be clear, the second largest carrier in the world has now created a little version of the phone to keep you addicted to the big version of your phone. And if you need even more evidence, look no further than Apple. Apple in 2017 announced that the app of the year was an uh, audio guided meditation app called Calm. So if you think about that for a second, in the same year that Apple became the world's first trillion dollar company, their best solution to keep us addicted to our phones is by rewarding and recognizing apps that effectively disconnect you from your phones. So right now there's two camps to the story. We have wellness gurus and wellness platforms like Goop telling you to just get away from media and ignore technology, which for most of us in this room I assume is probably nonsense. And then on the other side, we have science fiction writers who've all been predicting we're all totally fucked anyways because every surface is going to be a screen and every screen is going to be an ad and there's nothing that we can do about this future. But as marketers, we already know that's true today. Every surface is a screen and every screen is an ad. And for all that headsets and smartphones and tablets and every piece of technology was supposed to do to make our lives better, again, I would remind you that we've never been more depressed We've never been more anxious and we've never been more distracted as humans than we are right now. So ask yourselves, is there anything that we can do to pull ourselves out of this dystopian nightmare? Cue the angels singing. We think that our one savior in media is going to be sound. And if you're paying attention to what's happening in this audible revolution right now, it's actually pretty clear that audio could be the one thing that saves ourselves and rejects this dystopian nightmare. So when the Buggles in 1979 sang Video Killed the Radio Star, I think that they turned out to be emphatically wrong. Because as more and more consumers are trying to find ways to disconnect, they're not running away from media and technology, they're just getting away from their screens. And what does audio do but allows you to get away from your screens and spend less time in front of them like this, but put on your headsets or your headphones and just interact with the world around you. So in turn, now tech companies are trying to supply this new audible demand. For example, in the last year, Spotify has spent almost half a billion dollars on podcast companies. Um, Apple has entered the voice battle somewhat unsuccessfully. Google, four years after Apple, has finally made their native podcast player and hired dozens of specialists in the audio space. Michael Lewis, a very famous writer, is releasing his next book on Audible first. Uh, almost a third of Europeans are now listening to podcasts. That number continues to grow in pretty much every market in the world. Malcolm Gladwell, another famous writer, potentially the most famous in the world, is creating his own audio company after massive success in podcasting. Amazon's big bet for a TV show is based off of a podcast called Com Homecoming. Sirius has bought Pandora, and iHeart, who is still in bankruptcy, has decided to spend a lot of money on a podcast company to become profitable again. But this future that we're very quickly running towards, where sound will be prioritized over visuals, is perhaps no better evidence than the popularity of smart speakers. Because if you ask smart speaker owners, why do you like your device, the number one answer that they give is because it untethers them from their screens. And even more than that, I actually think it's really simple. So put, a, put aside all of that marketplace noise that I just talked about, and if you think about audio, it is the medium that is most intuitive to humans. Things like reading and writing have only been around for about 5% of modern human history. Things like video, obviously, just in the last 100 years. What have we always been able to do as humans but listen and tell stories and talk to each other, which is what podcasting is all about? And even more than that, as I spoke about in the last episode, people just like really good content. And audio today, and podcasting in particular, is really the last place on the internet where you can get high quality content for completely free, all subsidized by ads. So what are we working towards in this future? First, we have purposeful screen avoidance because of this trained addiction from the last 20 years. 
with the unprecedented amount of choice and how we can listen with tech companies now supplying this new audio demand with the open access to quality audio content because for the most part it's completely free which is leading us to a post screen future in which audio becomes the dominant source of media consumption and we begin to listen to content before we ever or if we ever see it which means we're going to hear about brands before we ever or if we ever see them and it's actually not that far off so in the span of history with smartphones, they've only ever increased in terms of sales. 2018 was the very first time in smartphone history that the sales for them actually declined. Headphone sales, meanwhile, are the number one consumer piece of hardware that is sold globally, which is how in the future, Apple may have to rely on Beats or its AirPods or any of its other uh, headphones to be its big profit driver as less people care about getting the latest shiny screen and the latest iPhone. However, our industry still talks about podcasting as if they are a nascent and niche space, which simply said, they're not. For example, more people in the US actually listen to podcasts than pay for a Netflix subscription. And completely unrelated to media, but simply to demonstrate how popular they are, more people in the US listen to podcasts than actually practice Catholicism. However, if you listen to podcasts, these are probably the brands that you hear. You hear the D2C brands on repeat. And while their ads, I think, are completely horrible, I would argue that brands like Squatty Potty, which is a real product, look it up after this, it's like the weirdest invention in the world. Brands like Squatty Potty have the most uh, robust audio strategy as compared to big time brands. Because while consumers are flocking to the space in the form of audiobooks and podcasts and music streaming, our industry still puts pennies into the space compared to the billions that we put into visual ones. So my question to all of you is, why have we placed a value on a medium based off of what it doesn't do? So why have we handicapped audio as something that doesn't provide a visualization to people when nobody in the art community would look at the scream and wish that they could hear the scream? I th actually think our industry should be in love with this space. How many of you, while you were driving, decided you had to turn down the radio so you could see better? Audio surrounds you, you cannot ignore it. Moreover, audio is incredibly emotive. So this is a chart right here of somebody listening to the Game of Thrones audiobook in red versus when they're watching the TV show in blue. And you can see pretty much across the board their EDA, which is their brain response, their heart rate and their temperature is much more elevated when they were listening to the book. Game of Thrones is the most visual TV show in history, perhaps ever, but the Game of Thrones audiobook was much more emotive and driving response for people. Yet if you're still skeptical, a third of people who own a smart speaker have said that it's replaced their time spent with television and video, so maybe video did not kill the radio star. And that's not to say that our industry is ignoring this completely. Things like sonic branding and sonic logos are now the new buzzword in our industry. It's why MasterCard has created their new sonic logo to play every time you make a transaction with their product because they want to instill what their brand stands for in people's hearts and minds. And publishers are chasing this as well. So the New York Times knows that its hit podcast, The Daily, which is one of the biggest podcasts in the world, is growing at an exponentially faster rate than most of its digital properties, and certainly faster than its print ones. So it's why they took out full page ads in their own newspaper to drive people to listen to their audio content, because the New York Times knows that increasingly more and more in their, of their readers are becoming listeners. And all of this is happening, I think, because audio is potentially more cognitively transformative than visual channels. And to explain what I mean by that, if you go back 50 or 60 years to the early days of radio, Orson Welles, one of the most famous writers of the 20th century, said that a famous radio drama at the time called Sorry Wrong Number was the single greatest script ever written. And when the New York Times decided to review the film that came out five years later, they called the film tedious. And in modern times, it's why shows like Dirty John, which were number one on iTunes for over three months, millions and millions and millions of downloads, critical acclaim when it was a podcast, and then Bravo turns it into a TV show and it's a complete flop. So sound as the standalone fixture provides this uniquely personalized experience in the minds of consumers. Storytellers can frame the narrative however they want, but only you get to decide what that story looks like in the imagination of your mind. And your brain actually does this something called self-visualization. So neuroscientists have found that when you listen to something, you visualize yourself in that experience. You don't do that when you see things, you only do that when you hear things. So if you think about audio as a channel, it's perhaps the most personalized one we have. 
So in this future, screens become the least premium inventory, and what's going on between your ears becomes the high stakes, which means that as more and more of us are listening to content before we ever see it, and we're hearing about brands before we ever, or if we ever see them, our visual identities become completely devalued. Um, this one's kind of scary, but probably true. Measurement of media will become a game of neuroscience. So this is a future in which Kantar or other measurement companies will probably install sensors into headphones to see how your brain reacts to audio content. And then finally, stories of the mind are paramount for personalization. So no person, and certainly no brand, can dictate the truth of what a listening experience looks like to you. So again, our industry loves to talk about personalization. It's one of the big buzzwords that you always hear, yet nobody talks about audio as being the most personalized channel. So how can brands prepare for this uh, audible future? Being in the business of pairing sight, sound, and motion to create some sort of emotion with people, I think somewhere along the way, as television and video and every other shiny object became the center of our media plans, we decided if we have to deprioritize something, sound would have to be it. But because we know audio is so emotive, it's so personalized, we have to think about our sonic identities. Um, next, from an investment standpoint, you can own entire content verticals still today. So think about which partners and stories you want to tell. And then finally, it sounds really simple, but think about audio strategically and not in tactics. Far few brands actually do this, which means thinking about your creative in a distinct way. So we are out of dystopia. Um, if you want to watch all of the episodes, you can go to mediadystopia.com. We have all of season one and all of season two on there. Uh, but before I end, we always end on this anecdote here from the cover of Forbes. And it says, Nokia, one billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? Can anyone with a Nokia phone please stand up? It's like kind of cute, it's so quaint. But it gets even funnier when you zoom in on the date. The date says November of 2007. Does anyone know what happened just a few months before this? Exactly, the iPhone came out. Uh, so the point being here that the future is already happening, you just have to look for it. So these are all the episodes, and on behalf of myself and Bernadette from The Big Bang Theory, thank you guys so much. <laughs>